Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman. And today we are thrilled to welcome a film historian and prolific author who has written about the making of Star Wars films, uh, among many of the Kubrick, James Bond, Hitchcock, and many, many others. Please help us welcome Paul Duncan. Paul, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, thanks very much for having me on. And uh... And for talking to me, it's such a lonely life being a writer. You're just all on <laughs> your own true. all day. <laughs> I know that and, then somebody, well. and then somebody says, oh, can we talk? And you go, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we get it. We get it. <laughs> so, well, you, you've written about so many different subjects and that it would be impossible to tackle them all. For this program so we're going to have to pick and choose a little bit but to start with what are some of the movies from your youth that made you really want to fall in love with film oh gosh um i i love movie movies from the very beginning you know from going to the cinema as a kid my uh, my mum or my uncles or, or or whatever would take me to the cinema so i would see a uh, jungle book I remember that Fantasia was amazing. Uh, I did see Escape to Witch Mountain as well. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> oh, that's great! Great! Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I was thinking. I, I, I do remember going to to see that and having a, a great time. Um, and then, uh, and then I would watch movies at home at the cinema. Sorry, at, at home on the TV, and uh, I remember. Um, Movies had all sorts of different effects on me. So obviously King Kong, I literally hid behind the sofa. <laughs> I, I, know a, I, I know it's a cliche, you know, but I did hide behind the sofa when, when King Kong was on. Uh, oh there was gosh, another, that's great. Uh, there was another one, um, uh, Wild Bunch, which I... Oh, um, I... I saw it. I was a teenager by this this point, and I saw it on a small black and white television in my bedroom late at night. And um, even though it was tiny and it was black and white, um, it had such an effect on me that I could remember every single scene in it mm. to such an extent that when it was repeated, reshown. Um, years later, I, I thought there was something different. There was something missing from it. And it was only later, many years later, that I found out that the second time it had actually been cut. You know, so intuitively, I, I, I understood that 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 it was was wrong. But but growing up, uh, I loved movies so much that I used to memorize them. I used to memorize the because this is pre. Blu-ray, pre-streaming, pre-VHS, um, yeah. uh, and I used to uh, memorize titles, and I got up to I think about 110 titles of movies that I'd seen that I'd remembered. Um, so that was that was very much in my youth, something that I uh, that I loved, yeah, and um, I just knew oh. I love this movie. I love that movie. <laughs> I need to remember it because there's no other way. Um, th there were no books in my local library for me to look at or you know, that I could find with, with these movies. And then it was only later, actually, when I uh, when I got my first job going out of university with my first paycheck, I went into a secondhand bookstore. And I actually picked up two film books secondhand um, in order to find out more about movies and how they were made. Uh, one of them was Crucified Heroes, which was all about um, 
the making of the Wild Bunch. Oh, well. mm. obviously, I I lo- I loved the movie, but knew nothing about it. I knew yeah. I, I didn't know the um, who directed it or who was in it or anything like that. So I picked up that that book purely because it was about the Wild Bunch, and then the other book was I'd just seen or recently seen Emerald Forest directed by John Borman and he had done a book like a diary about the making of it um, called Money Into Light and uh, and so w- those two books really they showed different two different approaches to talking about movies Crucified Heroes was more analytical it was about the dissection of the movie and analyzing and unpacking, mm. as they say nowadays. Money into Light was all about this idea of the practicalities of making a movie. So, so you know, pre-production, getting a script, getting financing, going on location, post-production, release, all the problems and issues. So, so really, that was my introduction into uh, into movie making, or, or mm-hmm. what what movie making was really about. Yeah, my gosh. Well, how how did you uh, get started writing about films yourself? Hmm. Well, I always um, I've always had many different interests. So, as well as films, uh, I loved uh, comics, and so. Um, so I actually did when I was fifteen. A friend of mine, Doctor Who. I'm in the UK, so Doctor Who was really big uh, in the 1970s and 80s when I was growing up. And in 1980, I was at school. I was 15. A friend of mine in the same class as me said, "Oh, um, I've." got these fanzines, these fan magazines all about Doctor Who, who's a really big Doctor Who fan. I, as it happened, uh, by this stage, I had discovered Star Wars and Close Encounters. Um, um, and the first Star Wars film had come out. Empire Strikes Back had not come out. And uh, I discovered Starburst and Starlog. Starburst was a UK magazine, Starlog, an American magazine. And I, I used to actually copy out um, some of the art, the articles that I liked, and I used to make my own little magazines. You know, in, <laughs> uh, I, 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 my dad brought home pieces of paper, you know, from a, um, uh, from the drafting office from where he worked, um, and um, he handed it to me because I love drawing. Uh, and one day I started ruling out pages and making up these little magazines with my own drawings i'd copy out i didn't know how to write really <laughs> so i used to copy out these different articles from different magazines i make my own magazine showed it to a <laughs> friend of mine he showed me these doctor who fanzines and we said well why don't we do our own magazine and so i i did my own fanzine called <laughs> arkansas uh 15 using the the school um, Gestet, Gestetner. Do you know what a Gestetner is? All right. No. So it's, uh, it's a drum, right, with a pad with ink in the middle, and you'd put, uh, you'd have a wax stencil. So do you know on typewriters, the old typewriters, you used to have stencil and where the ribbon doesn't go in? This was so that you could put a hole in this wax, this wax oh. page. And you put this wax page around this drum, and so the ink would go where you've typed. And that's how we made our first uh, fan magazine. Uh, that's great. <laughs> and so, but from there, basically, from, from that, I did that magazine and it became a comics magazine where I would interview um, uh, artists and writers, comics artists and writers. So it was really from that that I learned to write. I did that magazine for 10 years. It started, it became um, quite big. I sold five, sometimes 10,000 copies. Wow. Um, hmm. um, distributed internationally. Wow. You know, it was, um, 
perfect bound. Do I have a copy here? Uh, yeah, the the last. This is the last issue. Okay, so perfect bound. Oh, um, neat. God, that's so know, cool. That is great. Yeah, interviews with uh, Will Eisner, Jack Kirby, oh, Alex wow. Toth, Brian Bolland, Bill Sienkiewicz, Dave Sim. You know, it's, it's, giants in there. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it it was a big. It it was, it was like the it was like the British version of the Comics Journal, mm -hmm. which was was big in America. I read the Comics um, Journal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but that's where it became. But that was over ten years, and um, <laughs> and then I thought I'd done what I could. This is a long story, but anyway, um, about. So I did that till 1980, 1990, 1995. I loved uh, uh, film noir and noir fiction. And uh, so I started a, a, a magazine all about um, mystery fiction, as you call it, crime fiction, we call it here. I loved all the noir writers, so I'd interview people like uh, James Elroy, Lawrence Block, James Salis, Patricia Cornwell, people like that for this magazine. That, that I created, and uh, and then about five years later, I started Pocket Essentials because I love movies, and so I started doing this, um, which is uh, these were small, uh, like uh, Cliff Notes, York Notes, books, all about uh, all about film, mm -hmm. and uh, I did, uh, I wrote six of them I think six or eight uh, over two years and uh, edited about 50 of them and um, wow. in that in that period um so yeah so that's so that's really when I started writing about film mm -hmm. and um and that was great because what in order this is Hitchcock uh, mm -hmm. this was the first one I did and um, what it enabled me to do was to actually get all the videos at that point. Was DVDs in 19? Yes. The, yeah, they, I think DVD. by 95, yeah, that should be DVDs. And, and, yeah, no, this is 99 by here. So, But it was mostly videos. I couldn't afford the DVDs at that time. So I would, <laughs> yeah. I would, I would borrow... Um, because I was still working, a student, everything through all, all this period. This is all in my, my spare time. And um so the, the great thing about it was that it allowed me to actually sit down and watch the movies. I decided mm -hmm. I will watch them in the order they were made. So I mm -hmm. can see Hitchcock progress over the years. And uh, and see the different techniques that he'd hmm. used, and the visual motifs, the thematic motifs, um, and and really that that was that was such a joy, because you're you're doing something that you love to do, watch movies, but at the same time, um, you'll they're movies you've seen before, but you have to think about them and examine about examine them for a, a longer period of time and you start to see you know we start to see patterns whenever we do anything whenever we see anything we start to see patterns in our lives um and and that's what i was looking for in in hitchcock i was trying to see what were the patterns in in the hitchcock movies and uh, and that was great that was so so good to do can't oh, well, tell we're, you. We're we're dying to talk about Hitchcock in a couple of minutes, but you've you've also written about Kubrick and George Lucas and others. Is there mm -hmm. is there one director in particular that you admire more than others, and 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 why? Oh gosh, um, uh, Charlie Chaplin. I have to say, um, I I really really um, think that he's an underestimated director um mm. it's it, very simple very controlled um uh, very direct 
in, in what he does, but uh, having gone through all of the archives and seen his process, you understand that really what, what he was doing was he was writing with film. Uh, mm -hmm. Francois Truffaut, you know, the auteur theory and all, all this sort of stuff, uh, talks about the idea of, of writing with film, you know, of taking the the um, uh, the director as the author of the movie, which is not always the case. Uh, but in the case of Chaplin, you can actually say he was writing with film because not only was he the writer and the actor and the director, he was the producer, he was mm. the distributor, he was often the composer of the music, Oh, well, wow. uh, um, so um, he was the, as far as I can tell, he's the only filmmaker to have done all of these things at the same time. He also edited them together. Don't forget, he had mm. him and Rolly Totherow were, uh, Rolly Totherow was the cinematographer, and they would have multiple um, cameras. Uh, because uh, reproduction was so difficult, they would make different mm. eggs for the American market and the non-American market. Um, but but Chaplin was the guy who would sit um, with Raleigh and they would physically cut the movies together as well. Okay. So, um, you know, George Lucas, uh, I think, is probably in terms of total control and Kubrick, these are the sort of filmmakers that I, uh, Terence Malick as well, these are the sort of filmmakers I would think of as being the ones who are total filmmakers and the people I admire the most, but also because of the stories that they tell. And the thing, what they do is they take the philosophy of their life and the experiences of their life and they channel it through themselves into their work so that you will understand what they're thinking and feeling mm -hmm. through their movies. And I think that's really um, uh, great. And I think that's something that's great about Hitchcock as well. Well, like, like I mentioned before, you have so many great books that you've written that it'd be impossible to cover them all. And, and so we're just going to have to have you back to discuss the others. But when I, when I first contacted you, I mentioned that, right, we were discussing, wanted to discuss Hitchcock, uh, sure. which, you know, it's we just passed the spooky season and he's one of my favorite directors. So yeah, what yeah. about Hitchcock that and his films that you most admired enough that would propel you to write a book about him? That, you know, just what is it about Hitchcock himself? Well, but with Hitchcock, I found that you, you had to watch every single frame of the movie because every single frame was was loaded. It was loaded with, with something. And you didn't know what it was, but you understood that there was something that you were being told that was going to be important later on. And really, that's what I, I felt with Hitchcock growing up and that's why they became very um uh, so if i saw that there was another hitchcock movie that i hadn't seen um like for example you've got the background there for rear window um uh, there jonathan and mm. i i remember when jonathan uh, sorry not jonathan when when rear window was um it was uh it was restored and it was shown at prime time on television in, in, in the UK. So, you know, so it was a big movie. So it was really the first time I'd seen Rear Window. And virtually the whole movie is about looking. You know, we're looking at James Stewart looking at <laughs> other people. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> uh, and so... Uh, and so, uh, and so, you're saying, well, what's he looking at? Why is he looking at them? You know, and then you get through the movie all those different types of viewings of of watching the ways of watching. So all the different characters in the, each of those windows, 
which are like, you know, television screens or like cinema screens, are all different types of movies that he's watching. And we watch all those types of mm -hmm. movies. And, um, and uh, you know, I wasn't thinking that while I was watching it. I was just absorbed because I wanted to know what was going to happen next. But I think that this is the thing about Hitchcock that that appealed to me. Everything was loaded. There was there was always something else going on behind the obvious plot or character, um, and so that 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 was the thing. That's the thing you want to find out. What is that? And the only way of finding out is by watching the movies mm -hmm. and by thinking about them and having the movies. Um, stick with you in in your head and and the best excuse for doing that is to write a book <laughs> yeah because sure. if you write a book it forces you to to do the work yeah and uh, and so that that's what I did that's why really yeah. I write books um, and yeah. it's it's not to um uh, uh, to make money or, or or anything else is because I want to find out what's so fascinating about these movies, about these people and why they did it. Before we get into some of um, Hitchcock's specific films, when you were writing the book, did you discover some facts about Hitchcock himself that you didn't know or that surprised you? The thing that was really surprising when I first started um, researching and looking at it at Hitchcock because really I, I picked up a couple of books but not not that many when I because I couldn't afford it <laughs> um, and uh, and so uh, when I started doing the research I was really surprised that how dependent and what a team um, it was between Hitchcock and his wife Alma mm. and because she had started as a as a writer, as a script editor, um, so when during the uh, uh, the period of the silent cinema, when they they both started working, uh, Hitchcock was like a, a title designer, and hmm. so he would he was basically drawing the typography that you would see on the on the titles. And Alma was an editor, so she was like, in terms of the hierarchy on the movie set, she was much higher. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hitchcock fancied her, for want of a better word, and wanted to to take her out, court her, uh, but he wasn't. He didn't feel he was able to, because of her higher stat status. Uh, and so he had to wait until he built it he, himself up in uh, before he could ask her out and i think what was interesting is that um that was a real collaboration even though alma it, <coughs> even though alma effectively left in terms of credit and um, what you would see um uh, in terms of uh, uh, on the screen she was invisible. In reality, she was that backbone that Hitch needed uh, in order to uh, choose projects, mm -hmm. analyze scripts, uh, and really guide a film through all the pre-production processes um, before it could go out and be and be filmed. And I think that was really the biggest, if you like, lesson that that I learned from um, from the initial research, research. On, on Hitch. Yeah, um, and so and and if you look at his his movies, you really you really see it. You really see how solid the scripts are. The, you never get the feeling. You get the feeling that the characters are consistent throughout and except for one or two movies where they something seem a bit flaky and you you find out that things are happening behind the scenes but the but really 
And it's that solid storytelling that really you get from Hitchcock. You know that if you sit down in front of a Hitchcock movie, it's going to be well made, well directed. The story is going to be solid. Everything, it's it's like a guarantee, right? And and that's something almost unique nowadays. Oh, yeah, well, how, sure. how did he get his start in directing? Oh, basically, he was an assistant directing assistant director for a during the silent period for a director who was essentially drunk most of the time. So mm -hmm. he would he would he would come in and he would be doing. Uh, so Hitch was more of an he built himself up to an art director. Um, so he would be looking after the sets, etc. So he would be know what was, you know, where people were supposed to enter, where people were supposed to leave, where there were supposed to be steps. He had visited uh, Germany during the um, uh, the Expressionistic period. So when you've got people like Murnau and Lang and all their set designers uh, working in 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 Berlin and he's there on the set working on some of the same sets and walking around and seeing how they they do all their um, camera techniques how to design the uh, the sets etc so he's learning all that he's like a sponge taking all that in um, and at the same time he's having to direct for a director who's not really interested and hmm. who's drunk so he's covering uh, and that's how he's learning the trade, and um, uh, and that's how he starts directing and building, um, building is what you call your IP or your brand now. Right. Um, but his early movies were seen to be unreleasable, and that's what's just amazing. You know, when you look at. Um, some of his uh, uh, his early films, uh, they were seen by the by the producer, and the producer said, "This isn't really a very British movie <laughs> because Hitchcock was influenced by the Expressionists." The um, nobody will understand this, yeah, because <laughs> it it's it's it, it it's just told if you like the storytelling. Is different uh, because Hitchcock, what he, what he took in from the expressionists was the idea of pure cinema. The idea, one of the great things about silent cinema, when you get into the the twenties, is that cinema is already twenty years old, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't have sound, and what the expressionists were now really more than the others what they had learned is that you can tell a story purely through the action and through the use of the um of the camera um uh, how the camera moves how the camera is framed how people are are, are moved and framed within it mm -hmm. and also little um artistic techniques for for telling you what people are thinking and and this is what hitchcock was learning and he was applying this aspect of pure cinema uh, to his films and uh, and this is the reason why even when sound came in a lot of hitchcock's movies are, are still pure cinema. Many of his greatest moments are without dialogue. Oh. Uh, uh, rear window. Mm -hmm. um, the whole opening sequence is just looking, James Stewart reacting. Looking, James hmm. Stewart reacting. Yeah? And, and it's great because you understand... Hitchcock knew the whole idea that if you show somebody kissing and then you show somebody watching that person kissing, you're putting certain ideas into the head 
of the person watching. In the same way, in Psycho, when um, Norman Bates is looking through the hole in the wall mm -hmm. at Janet Lee, we, we're there. We're then putting thoughts into Norman Bates. We're we're we're, we're taking both his point of view, and we're thinking the thoughts that we may have are then. Uh, we think them, then we see Norman Bates, and then we think that Norman Bates is thinking what we're thinking. Yeah. So, so this is a technique that Hitchcock used all the time throughout all of his movies uh, in order to put the audience in the point of view of the, of the different characters, even the horrible characters, hmm. which, is, which is one of the, I think, um, uh, one of the unique aspects of Hitchcock and really puts him beyond, above and beyond many other um, uh, directors and filmmakers uh, because he was willing to have central characters that were unlikable. Mm. And, uh, and if you like, and sometimes they were the villains and the bad guys. It's always a, a, a good sign when you see somebody like James Stewart, who always plays these beautiful, pure characters, or you see somebody like Cary Grant, who always plays these um, suave, sophisticated characters. Suddenly, in Notorious, Cary Grant is horrible. Mm -hmm. he, he is gaslighting and he is abusing Ingrid Bergman in 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 the film he is a horrible horrible person and he's doing horrible things but but it's sort of understandable um, and then you see Ingrid Bergman doing the things that she does in that movie because of her love for him yeah um, so she's sort of enabling him to to do that in mm -hmm. order to prove her love for him, which is then reciprocated by the end. Well, it... in uh, and it's the same with um, uh, James Stewart in Vertigo. Mm -hmm. James Stewart, you think of him as a sympathetic character, but by the end you realise that he is completely obsessed and delusional. He is not somebody you want to be. Yet, through the use of the camera and pure cinema, Hitchcock has put you in that place. And I think part of the, um, part of the feeling that you get from these movies is you feel unclean, you feel sullied uh, to an extent. So your reactions to them are not the same as your reactions to other movies because you realize that you've been manipulated into a position that's that's not nice for you as the viewer that's best what though so you he did not get his due in all the early films what at what point do you think that that he finally got put on the radar i guess of you know the big commercial you know, the big public audience that people say, hey, this is someone that we should be paying attention to. Well, really, the first in the UK, the first film was really Blackmail, which was the first sound mm -hmm. film, because that was that was a subject which was extremely controversial. He had a, an enormous star in it um, playing the lead role. And um, and he was. Um, uh, and he was playing what could have been a villainous character. He was put, he was shown on the screen like Nosferatu, hmm. yeah, almost like a, a, a vampire entering a, um, uh, a, a entering a, a boarding house, uh, and he's seen as the villain of the piece. But. Through pure cinema, Hitchcock turned that movie into a, a core celeb, 
partly because it was a sound movie, partly because of his use of sound, because of the subject matter of crime movie. He had not all his movies were crime movies up to this point. And, and if you like, he, uh, he was seen as, from, from that point on in the UK, he was seen as a master of cinema. So, so if you like, that was his first, his, his first touch of, of fame, uh, which he then continued throughout his career in Britain. As the films got bigger and bigger, 39 Steps is, you know, just amazing. Lady Vanishes, etc. And then he, often Man on the Run movies, you know, The Wrong Man, uh, somebody who is who hasn't done the horrible thing that everybody says he's done, that's that's the character who goes on the run and then has to prove themselves innocent. So uh, an old thriller sort of trope. Then what happens is he realises that Britain is too small for him. The UK is it's too small a market. And if he makes a film in Britain, he may sell it to America, but it's, it's never going to go big. And uh, he makes the, this decision in order to go for the where the money is, which is Hollywood. He, he joins up with Selznick and he does Rebecca. Mm-hmm. And Rebecca is really, that was his like, all right, I've arrived. Yeah. Um, I, I do this movie. It's uh, Daphne du Maurier. It's Joan Fontaine. It's um, it, you know, it's just a great Hollywood movie. He played it safe, added a few of his own touches, and he really made it work. And that was his calling card. He, he basically said, "Look, I'm here. You know, I can do this stuff. You know, give me some more work." And then it becomes a matter of him uh, trying to find his voice in America. So uh, uh, with with Selznick, he's tied to Selznick. Selznick wants to control him. He can't control Hitchcock. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of tension between Selznick and Hitchcock through these years. Eventually, Selznick has to sort of hire him out and make tons of money on Hitchcock as as Hitchcock star is descending. And then at the end of this period, Hitchcock then has to go out on his own. Mm. And um, so he's making great movies, right? But Hitchcock really needs to get his independence Mm. in order to become, you know, master of his own domain and do everything that he he needs to do and make movies like Rear Wonder and Vertigo. Yeah, what what, what point would do you feel that he really started hitting his stride and and making what we would come to think of as a Hitchcockian film? Oh gosh. Well I think it's in his British period. Uh, oh, I, I think okay. if you if you have a look at if you have a look at 39 Steps and mm-hmm. Young and the Innocent, these are just great movies. And he's basically remake remaking those movies in mm-hmm. America. When you see something like uh, 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 Saboteur, uh, which is a great early, um, um, uh, you know, warning about the the fifth column in America. He's he's remaking Thirty Nine Steps uh, in America, and and that's what what he's doing. North by Northwest, which I think is is it fifty eight, fifty seven, some something like that. Um, I should look it up in one of my. <laughs> you've got all the reference material you need yeah, right? yeah. yeah. L- 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 let me look that up for you this is uh, <laughs> uh, l- l- let me see north by northwest that's an excellent movie um uh it was he did wrong man vertigo yeah north by northwest 1959 pardon me and um that that is essentially the ultimate the ultimate uh, expression of the thirty nine steps, w- which he had made twenty years earlier. 
and um, so so it's he was going bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So so I I don't think if you like I don't, I I think he found his his himself as a filmmaker uh, during his British period, but I think what he did was there's a, a certain point, and this happens with all creative people is that there's a certain point where you need to push yourself beyond what you can do. Because why should you remake the same thing over mm -hmm. and over again? You need to push yourself into new areas. And that's what he was doing. The Wrong Man, which, which I think is, is a great, great movie. Based, It's a true crime movie based on a real case. Going to the places where... Um, uh, Ballestero, the central character played by uh, Henry Fonda, uh, going to the places where he, um, uh, where the incidents actually happened, sometimes using the actual people that were uh, in the in, in the true crime. I mean, this is how much people people don't seem to realise how much attention to detail um, uh, Hitchcock went into. For for Rear Window, for example, uh, going back to the to your background, Jonathan, the, he actually got a film a photographer uh, who was living in New York to shoot what he could see out the back of his apartment in order to use as reference <laughs> for that set. Yeah, <laughs> and and, and he, he did the same thing with. Um, uh, you know, so if there was a, a certain pe person in a per, uh, in a particular situation in a movie, he would find a real life equivalent, yeah, to reference, mm. uh, to as as reference as the beginning point, as the starting point for that part of the production, both in terms of costumes for Edith Head, for the production design. For 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 everything, you know. So Henry Bumstead or whoever was doing the production design, art directors, so that they uh, mentor Hubner doing the storyboards or or whatever. So that everybody involved in the production, his own team, um, was constantly involved in every part of the process, so that they understood what the story that was going to be made. You know, the Melo. Mm -hmm every the, the whole setting <coughs> and um uh, so um so what was the original point get me back to it oh which just you, yeah just which 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 I had the, the like, point like so, like so so all of these all of these were expressions of of hitchcock hitchcock from an early um from an early age he was in a grocer's he, he was growing his dad was um at a grocery store and was a distributor of groceries this is why in frenzy it's set in covent garden um, because it harks back to hitchcock's own own life uh, the idea of doing um uh, blackmail based on uh, the uh, uh, the hitch uh, the jack the ripper murders um is because when Hitchcock was growing up, he he lived in the East End. All he heard about growing up was about Jack the Ripper. Hmm. Yeah, it was only a few years beforehand, before he was born, that Jack the Ripper had created those murders. So, so as he was growing up, he was hearing about that. That set off a lifelong interest in true crime. This is why he did Paradigm Case and another. You know, Another stories that are based around the process of of trials and murderers, um, be, because it was a subject he was interested in. Shadow of a Doubt, Thornton Wilder, um, absolutely, um, you know, one of his his best movies, um, all based on on research. This is a point where Hitchcock had to learn about America. He had to l learn about American small town life. Yeah, so he had to 
integrate and assimilate into American culture. Um, so this was all part of his, this, this new thing he had to learn, um, um, this constantly looking for something which is new and different. This is why he moved on to uh, Vertigo, uh, Baloo and Narajak, the writers of, of, of the movie, uh, of, of, um, uh, of the original novel of which um, uh, Vertigo was made, from which mm -hmm. Vertigo was made. They'd written uh, Les Diabaliques, uh, which was turned into a movie by Henri-Georges Clouseau. It'd been an, this enormous hit in uh, worldwide. And Hitchcock, you know, loved reading Cornell Woolrich, on which Rear Window was uh, based. Um, he loved reading all of these um, uh, thriller uh, and noir and mystery writers. And, you know, so immediately he bought um, Baloo and Narajak's uh, original story, <laughs> The Living and the Dead, the, the novel, for, for to make Vertigo. So he was always looking for the new thing, the next thing. Uh, and Vertigo is, 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 is essentially based on the idea of the spiral. Uh, so the spiral that you see, mm -hmm. this is the idea of Vertigo as being, you know, having this, this idea, but also the spiral of, of characters actually going around and round in circles and where are they going to end up? You've got, again, the visually because Hitchcock was a very visual uh, filmmaker, you've got the, the image of the tree and the, and the circles of the tree, mm -hmm. seeing the, 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 the time, uh, seeing how old the tree is, but also that links into the, um, the themes of the, of, of the character, the imaginary character of this woman being reborn and feeling that she's been reborn and then in reality this character this this person this image of this person being reborn and then um and J the james stewart character re remaking uh, the character that kim yeah. kim novak makes yeah. so so what i'm saying is that this is this is the work of a total filmmaker somebody who's not only visually literate but is um, literate in terms of text and the subtext of the movies and uh, and this is why they're so celebrated not, not because he can scare you or interest you but because there's more to the movies than just sitting down and watching them now, I'm just curious just off topic you mentioned some of the films one of the things that we all love is, is the cameos when, when did that start actually I think actually it was blackmail. Was it? That let, was the first let, one. Let, let, let me look it up in my book. <laughs> because uh, I, actually, I, I I should say that uh, I did this, um, which was 1999, and we, you know it was reprinted multiple times, and and then I started working for Tashin, and the first book I did was this, <laughs> right, and then it came out. Is this a bigger version? Right. In the hardback. And then many years later, we, we did this version, which uses my essay uh, or as, as the front of the book. Uh, and then there's things on uh, different essays by That's different cool. authors at the back. You know, uh, this is, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing, really. But I did put the cameos, every single cameo, and uh, and the first one is in the uh, 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 the lodger. Sorry, it's not um, it's not uh, it's not really blackmail, which I think is his first big film. It's uh, the lodger. Pardon me, I misspoke earlier. Because the, the lodger is about um. Uh, the central character uh, entering a, a boarding house and then um, at that point 
thinking that uh, everybody thinks that he is Jack the Ripper, effectively. Mm -hmm. And and then we find out, so he's the wrong man. Uh, I, I mistitled it as, as blackmail. But um, but yeah, but that was the first the first time that we that we see uh, Hitchcock. Sorry, I'm include uh, images here. <laughs> All right, so you can see. And Hitch always maintained that it was because he needed something to fill the frame. And um, <laughs> yeah, and him being a, a big lad, <laughs> portly. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, he, uh, he could that's... fill fill the frame. You only see the back of him. That makes sense, but but the but then it became like a superstition, you know, because right. the film had been successful. Got to keep going. He then could uh, <laughs> uh, uh, he wow. then include it in everyone. So, uh, but yeah, I, I went through all the movies and took uh, frame grabs of them all, and uh, uh, and put them in the in the book, which was good. <laughs> it's good fun, yeah. And sometimes well, there's more than one. There's more than one cameo in some of them. Oh gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I haven't. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I've been playing that close of attention, I guess. Yeah. Well, we were reading that he was always fighting with the censors about his content. Yeah, I I think that um, you've got to remember that he he had to work within his own. Um, he had to work within Hollywood, and he had to work within the the confines of um, the motion picture. Uh, uh, you know the the sort of the production code, and so and so one of the things is that the um, the villain can't get away with it, or does or do they can only kiss for so for so long? Mm. So for ex for example, famously on um, uh, Notorious, mm. there's. Uh, uh, Cary Grant is effectively seducing Ingrid Bergman um, in order to get her to spy on her her father's Nazi friends, and uh, and so they have a scene which is, is essentially them kissing for more than three minutes, and um, or however long it was, but well, it was a long, long time, uh, and the censors wouldn't allow that. You know, you, there's a slip, very strict <laughs> number of seconds when you're allowed to kiss. Amazing. Um, I, I, I don't know who comes up with this. You know, if there's a stopwatch, then, <laughs> yeah, that's okay, kiss, kiss. No, you can't kiss, that's too rude now. You know, I mean, who decides this stuff? You know? <laughs> well, yeah, anyway, it's, always, it's always, always baffled me. I mean, completely baffled me. Yeah. Um, can can it, you imagine? It, seem, it seems who, arbitrary. Who, Whose it's job like, is that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's exactly the sort of thing you can imagine a committee yeah. getting together in order to do that. And, and there's, you know, you, you've got a wide range of people on the committee saying, well, no, I, I think I think 32 seconds is too long. I think 31 is just enough. You know, it's just like, it's just crazy. So, so, Hitch, so there's always a way around it. So, and Hitchcock, he's he's always thinking outside the box. He's always there, and uh, he says, "Right." So they kiss, right, and then <laughs> and then they stop. You know, thirty-one seconds in, they stop and they have a bit of dialogue. Then they kiss again, and then they stop and thirty-one <laughs> seconds. You know, <laughs> and, and it just breaks it up. You know, so it's essentially. It's even it's even better in effect, <laughs> yeah. Because because then because it's the whole thing because because what what he's doing is that there's the 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 sexual en energy and chemistry mm -hmm. between the two characters, but also within the the text and the dialogue, there are two things going on. There's one Cary Grant manipulating. Ingrid Bergman, and Ingrid Bergman accepting the manipulation because she loves him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a sort of tension because you you feel you feel sorry for her, but also, and at the same time, you understand that he's got a job to do, 
because he needs to capture these Nazis, but he's doing this horrible thing. So, so that these conflicting emotions meeting um, at the same time, and Hitchcock is always doing that. He's always mixing it up so that you, you, you're feeling multiple things at the same time. And he's completely aware this is hmm. going on. Well, we, we want to talk about some of the specific films now. And so we'll start with, you know, like we mentioned, my favorite film is Rear Window. You know, starring yeah. Jimmy Stewart and Grace Kelly. It's such an unusual style for a film. It, you know, besides voyeuristic, it's very claustrophobic. How, how did all this come about? And can you tell us a little bit about the making of that movie? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I think earlier <laughs> I was talking about the idea of pure cinema. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that Hitchcock always said is that you can't really make a a great movie out of a novel, but you can make a great movie out of a short story. He says movies are short stories. They're not really novels. Mm. And um, uh, and Rear, Rear Window is based on a short story by Cornell Woolrich, who wrote on the various names like William Irish and George Hopley. And uh, and many, many of his uh, short stories and novels have been turned into movies. Mm -hmm. Once you have a look at, you know, the IMDb page, mm -hmm. you realise just how influential and just how great uh, he, he is. I mean, I, I've read virtually everything by him. So this is a short story. It's, it's a very uh, simple idea which is that somebody is looking outside their, their window uh, and they, they think that the guy opposite is up to no good and, hold on a minute, his wife has disappeared. <laughs> oh, and a dog is, is digging in the garden. Has he buried his wife? What, what's going on? Yeah, how will I investigate? Yeah. But at the same time, the guy is in a wheelchair, so he can't investigate. So what does he do? How does he deal with the situation? Uh, and 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 so uh, so what Hitchcock does is he he draws you into this person's world first by telling you through the opening um, uh, uh, pan and the movement of the camera. That the character you're about to see is actually a, a photographer. His job is to look at people, hmm. yeah, and to photograph them. And um, he's won awards. So before we even see James Stewart, Hitchcock is telling you through the camera, he's giving you information, and then you see. You, not only that, but it's. It's hot. It's dreadfully hot. Yeah. So it's summer. It's a photographer. He's a famous photographer. Then you see his, his leg is broken. Right. So he can't move. He can't do his job. It's summer. He's trapped in this room. Yeah. He's multiple flights up. So how is he going to get out? Yeah. You, it's, it's unlikely that there's a a lift or elevator um you know so so he's literally trapped in this room and the only thing he can do is look at people and so we he sh hitchcock shows us this guy looking at people and his reactions to all the the ebb and flow of life so so this is if you like how how it's set up right from the first scene and then things are built in. Hitchcock takes his time. He's given you information. And, and this is something that I remember um, when I met with George Lucas, who mm -hmm. was doing the Star Wars Archives book. Um, um, George was talking about the, the drip, the dripping, the constant drip of information. 
So every time that you show something, the same thing, if you like, you have to show something different so that you can't repeat a thing. You have to add to it so that people get more information from it. You develop it. So, for example, in the case of specifically, we were talking about uh, lightsabers in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So so you see the progression of the first time you see a lightsaber is when it's handed from Obi-Wan to Luke and it operates fine. The second time you see it, Obi-Wan takes his lightsaber out in the cantina and it's just a flash and somebody's arm comes off. Yeah. So it's shown as something that's deadly as a deadly weapon. So that's a piece of information you didn't really know or understand before, but now you know for real that this is a serious thing. The third time you see it is when Luke is training, right? And at that point uh, in the Millennium Falcon, and then you realize how difficult it is to operate and to use. So the skill that Obi-Wan showed, right, is not something that can be learned easily. It's something that has to be learned over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So, so if you like, each time a thing is introduced or shown, a new piece of information has to be added. And this is what Hitchcock does in, in Maria Window, in that behind every single one of those windows that, story. that, uh, that uh, James uh, Stewart is looking out of is a different story. And we see a different part of that story and his reactions to it as as we go through it and then at a certain point the tone changes because um because of the idea of the the murder mystery but also you begin to understand that uh, james stewart each one of those stories that we see behind the windows is also the story of James Stewart. Right. There's it, you know, the th those different characters are all reflections of what's going on inside him. He's not just seeing them; they are what could happen to him. They are all stories, yeah. And um, so the 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 guy on the piano on his own who's lonely, yeah. That could be James Stewart the rest of his life. He could be have parties, could have people around, but really he's sad and lonely as a character. Yeah. I was, I was just trying yeah. to think, like, what, what's the pitch meeting? You know, saying, I'm going to take one of the biggest stars in, in Hollywood and I'm going to have him <laughs> sit in a room for two hours and not move. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but at this, you're, you're right, yeah. but... At this point, Hitchcock is so is his own producer, right? Shamley Productions. He's not only his own producer; he's his own. Uh, he can do whatever he wants. So, so if you like, he has to persuade perhaps Lou Wasserman or a few other people. But he's got carte blanche. He's also, um, he's also doing uh, the TV show. Right. The Alfred Hitchcock, um, which I, I have, I have them all on on discs back there, uh, for which he directed a few of them, and 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 this this also I think in America propelled him to another level, because he realised very early on that <clears throat> brand Hitchcock is the brand he needs to to sell. Um, and once he had the TV show going, it was easier for him to sell the movies and persuade people to do his movies. Because he had the larger audience by then. He did. Yeah. Right. It didn't always work out. But <laughs> I, I think what, what you've got to remember is is that Rear Window is when he's at the height of his, his fame, that he could do an experiment. This, this is experiment. He's doing these experimental movies at this point. 
Hmm. You know, this uh, wrong man, true crime, which is a, a more like a documentary feature than anything else. Um, he's doing um, Trouble with Harry. He's doing um, Vertigo, which is like nobody in their right mind would okay <laughs> Vertigo. No, no film studio. Um, and then he did North by Northwest, which is an enormous success, which sort of gets him an, an audience back. You know, so what he loses on one, he gains with the other. Um, and then it's it's really at this point that he he loses it and he can't he can't really do the films he wants to do. <clears throat> and uh, and that's when he because he wants to do Psycho. So he, he, he can't get a film studio to really back that. So he says, right, I'll go ultra cheap. I'll go black and white. I'll use my um, uh, my TV crew, in effect, low, low, low budget, and I'll do it that way. So we found another way of doing it. But but there were an increasing number of projects that he couldn't get going, even after Psycho, um, because he, uh, because all the studio, Universal, etc. They just they wanted him to make the same movies he had made before, Cookie yeah. Cutter, yeah, instead of experimenting. He was into Antonioni, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni, Italian filmmaker, and he, he saw um, um, uh, um, uh, Blow Up, Blow Out, and um, uh, Blow Up, and he said, well, I want to make movies like that. And wanted to make something that was pure, pure cinema that, uh, you know, about uh, psycho killers, serial killers. You know, if, if he had been making, he would have in the 90s and early 2000s, you know, with Hannibal Lecter and things like that. You know, they would have been calling out, you know, for Hitchcock to make those type of movies. But in the 1960s, 30 years earlier, no. You know, he, he, he couldn't get the name. Mm. Well, we want to talk a little bit about To Catch a Thief with Grace Kelly and Cary Grant. What what can yeah. you tell us about this film? And we've read that one of Hitchcock's reasons for doing it was because he wanted a vacation in the south of France. Is that actually true? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm sure. Why not? He, he loved Samaritz. <laughs> <Ritz. laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, he, he did. In fact, he did. Um, it, it may sound funny, but at the very first version of um, the man who knew too much was set in San Moritz, right? Hitchcock went skiing in San Moritz. You know, it, it was it was not. Um, you know, him and his wife, if they want to go off somewhere. Let's set a movie there. And um, uh, let's go skiing. Um, in in all the early in all the early um, silent movies he was doing, he was going around Lake Como and all all around Europe. And um, so he he was used to that travel, that idea of going to exotic places. And also that was very appealing to to film goers in the uh, in the nineteen fifties. The idea of jet travel and uh, air travel was just coming in. And in the 1960s, it was becoming more affordable. This is one of the reasons um, the James Bond movies, the James Bond books, and then the movies were so successful because they always had this element of the exotic locale. Mm -hmm. and, and Hitchcock was very aware of this. You know, the, the second version of Man Who Knew Too Much, set in North Africa, Gave him an excuse to go to Tunisia and to film there, uh, and to add that exotic element uh, to to his movies. So, um, so no, I completely believe it. You know, <laughs> I completely believe that. You know, he wanted to be spend time in the sun uh, with his wife and daughter. Who wouldn't? The um. 
you mentioned you mentioned vertigo. You just talking about you know before Jimmy Stewart. And it, it, this felt it, it was a little bit more like a Hitchcock movie than To Catch a Thief was to me. Um, I just recently rewatched it because my daughter was assigned it for film school. But it, it's yeah. it's really such a dark film, it, like you mentioned. So what what were some of the you know stories about making that? Because it, it just seemed much darker tone to me at least than the previous films that he had done. Yeah, I th I think that and you I... hit upon it a little bit before because Jimmy Stewart was like really unlikable a lot of he was obsessive and unlikable in some aspects. Yeah, I th I think that um I mean Jimmy Stewart is an interesting actor. Uh, much more complex, I think, in some of his movies. Um, after the war, after World War, pre-World War II, he's basically a comedic actor. He is um, very likable, uh, uh, a lovely, uh, very upbeat. He, uh, there's a lot of integrity uh, uh, about him as, as a character. But a bit of a um, a bit whimsical and a bit um, uh, I don't know what you would say in America but he's, he's with the fairies sometimes as we would say um, uh, you know that his, his head is in the clouds and um, in the um, after World War II his experiences I mean he he was one of those actors who actually went and did actually have combat experience during World War II. And he came back and he, the first film he did was It's a Wonderful Life, which is um, a, a very uh, deep and meaningful movie, made no money, uh, was a flop, um, only became famous afterwards in TV reruns. But what it did was it showed an aspect of of, of Stuart that hadn't really been seen before. And you, you'll see on various movies where he is playing the light lead, but then others like um, in Anthony Mann Westerns, where he's playing these quite obsessed and, um, uh, and troubled characters. And what Hitchcock was doing is he understood that as a lead actor, he could handle that type of role. Yeah. So, so it wasn't unknown for, for, for Jimmy to do that type of role. Hmm. But um, but you know, it's it's like going in and not knowing what what he was going to, to do, and then it, it turns dark. He starts off as somebody who's very who has integrity he's a, a policeman he wants to catch his man but he has a fatal flaw a weakness he has vertigo and and, and this lets um uh, uh, lets uh, the the robber get away but at the same time because he pushed himself forward a, a policeman died uh, and so does this feeling of guilt of culpability of being responsible um for the death of somebody else because of his weakness and um and, and that haunts him for 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 the rest of the movie now i think that this idea of obsession um is something that i'm sure hitchcock understood um, he was, uh, 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 he, uh, I mean, if you look at the way that he created his movies, he always um, uh, had this obsession for detail, for perfection, for um, um, the way the image was framed, the movement, the rhythm, Everything he needed to be done um, in in his language, 
and it was a matter of finding the techniques that would allow him to tell the story in that language. Mm -hmm. So in the case of vertigo, what you have, which is, I think, underappreciated with Hitchcock, is you have a rhythm um, to, to the scenes. It's a very slow rhythm, right? But it is, there is a sort of heartbeat rhythm to the way that things happen. <clears throat> and there's a, a repetition. And you understand that that repetition uh, is part of the obsession. This is where this idea of the spiral comes in. Yeah. So when he finds um, uh, the Kim Novak character and follows her, he's she's leading him into this spiral, into this idea of obsession, uh, and that spiral is also in her um, in her hair at the back. There is a spiral. In fact, when I had a look at, I had to look at. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a look at some of the um, uh, original hair um, uh, tests and makeup tests that Kim Novak did, and you can actually see that Hitchcock tried lots and lots of different types of hair on Kim Novak, and there was one with a spiral at the back of the hair, the way it's been put together, and that's the one he chose. Yeah. So he understood visually what he was doing, but also the whole process of filmmaking is this idea of taking a person and remaking them mm -hmm. in uh, to look like somebody else. So if you like, what what Jimmy Stewart was doing is he had a, a role model for a character he's obsessed with. He then takes another woman and remakes her in that role model in the same way that Hitchcock had an idea for a character. He then takes an actress in order to remake her, to dress her, to put makeup right. on so that she does that role yeah. So Hitchcock understood that this idea of obsession was something that he had himself. Th these are not accidents. You cannot you cannot create movies, you cannot analyze movies, you cannot tell stories for decades upon decades without understanding the process that you go through and your own obsessions. Um, so yeah, so I, th I think that vertigo is at the heart of it, understood as a series of, of obsessions, and Hitchcock recognizing those obsessions in himself. Mm, wow. Well, the the last of the Cary Grant Hitchcock films and another one of my favorite, personal favorites is North by Northwest. What are amazing movie. anecdotes you have um, you heard about from that movie? Well, I, I think this is, um, oh gosh, um, anecdotes from that movie. Or, well, I think, I, th I think there's a lot made of um, the idea that Hitchcock had everything planned, right? So, all, all filmmakers, when they um, when they make movies, certainly you you, you see something like uh, Mike Scorsese. He talks about in his early movies, uh, he would do little thumbnails of every single uh, shot of his movie before he started filming. Right, and uh, uh, Bill Crone did a great book on Hitchcock, Hitchcock at Work. Mm -hmm. I know Bill, great guy, um, and and he he basically on uh, North by Northwest, he showed that the 
the idea that we have of Hitchcock is there's somebody who is in complete control. He tells you in interviews that what he does is he plans everything out. He does storyboards. And then he follows the storyboards and he's so good at it. He doesn't even have to look in the camera because he's got everything planned and he's in complete control. And this is this is not true. Um, and 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 you see it in the way that um, if, if you look at storyboards for for scenes, which is what Bill Crone did, and he compared them to the finished scenes, you'll see that they don't match, that there are differences. Hmm. And you have to you have to understand that the filmmaking craft is um you know writing is rewriting, filming is refilming, editing is re editing. So it's it's never a singular process within the idea of a production environment, all studios want to hear from you, oh, yes, mm -hmm. I have an idea, I have a vision for it, yeah, and, and, then, uh, and then I film it, and then I cut it together, and it's done, yeah, but that is never the case. Because what happens is that you have an idea, you have an idea of, you know, you you visualize it, right? Then when you film it, it comes out different to how you visualize it. So you have to adapt it and you rethink it. And then when you see the, the dailies for it, you realize that what you thought you caught, you didn't call, you didn't capture, so maybe you have it doesn't cut together. So you have to film, film some other stuff, and then when you re when you edit it together, you realize that maybe you miss something. You have to redo. It has to be a shot because the rhythm is wrong, or you have to take some of the existing footage and you put it in. You roll it backwards or you extend it. <clears throat> so in order to fill out the space in order to get the correct rhythm so it's all so this is this is really the thing that if you have a look very closely at these scenes for instance the the, the great scene with the um the crop duster coming down <laughs> on on cary grant you realize that the 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 filming of it and the editing of it is different to the to, to the shots that they had planned out because those are just blueprints. Producers never like and studios never like to hear this because every time you say um, uh, reshoot extra days, um, <laughs> yeah, etc. etc. Et what it's about <laughs> is money. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So. So you never admit it, right? But in effect, every movie you see goes through those processes. So if you like, um, I, I, I love I love seeing storyboards and all this sort of stuff because mm -hmm. it shows what they intended. But the reality is, they come up with something that's a little bit different and a little bit skewed, and um, because when you when you have the footage, right, that's when the real filmmaking begins. Mm -hmm. You know, everything else, you know, production is not production. Production is still pre-production. Post-production, which is the editing, is the real production of a movie. Well, I, I do. Before we let you go, I do have to ask you one thing about, you know. You, uh, you sorry, about... I need to. We, I need to uh, plug in my phone. Because <laughs> I'm running, <laughs> I'm running out of power here. Yeah, it's like I had to pull out my headphone yeah. because my battery was running low. So, like, we're all, we're all, we're all dealing I, with. I, 
I'm, I'm just rambling here. You know? That's all right. Well, That's all right. We love it. We, you, you, need, oh, way, you need to you need to cut it down you know, <laughs> into about the five essential minutes. Okay. <laughs> I do have to show you my uh, my rear window thing that if I can see it here at all. Let's see. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, it's disappeared, Jonathan. Uh, I see. I see that here. We, if we can, uh, I can't even see it on the camera. Yeah. I do have a. There it is. Yeah, it's a little, little bit. I do have this hanging in front of my desk, so I, I do look at the rear window set all day. <laughs> so, Fantastic. The uh, I, we do have to ask you, you. You're talking about obsession before in some of these films, and that it leaked into real life. It, according to a lot of the stories, you know, from the you know much has been written about good or bad about yeah. Hitchcock and the way he treated people. Like for example, you know, Tippy Hedren stories. So. Yeah. What what did you find during research about how people felt about Hitchcock? Well, I have to say most people loved Hitchcock, mm -hmm. and and I think also there is there is an aspect of Hitchcock which I think is uh, is there, which is that he had um, a very um, dirty sense of humor mm -hmm. so um so he, he, he's a very there's a certain sense of humor in the uk in london in um in a sort of working class environment um that hitchcock grew up in even though he was really middle class in terms of money Mm -hmm. But the interaction in the sh one of the things I love if if you is always the the character actors in a Hitchcock movie. So I mean this this has a bearing on 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 what you're talking about because mm -hmm. because if you have a look at um, blackmail, you see people coming to the shop and they're talking and then. Uh, as Hitchcock uses the word knife. So as they're talking, whenever the word knife is said, it's amped up so that you hear it as knife, knife, blah, 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 knife, blah, 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 knife, all, all the way through the scene. He has these characters talking in all of his movies. He always has these working class, these other characters um, making comments having these little funny asides, et cetera. That was Hitchcock. That was that was his sense of humor and that, that was his sensibility. And so, and that's how he was on set. And that's how he was with the, um, uh, with the crew. That's how he was with the other actors, right? So it was almost, he, it was just, Sometimes it's a bit harsh. It's a bit depreciating. He's not treating the the um, the main actors mm -hmm. as royalty. Um, he's not treating them as special or better than anybody else. He's treating them as part of the crew. And the people that the actors and actresses that he got on best with were were those who understood that i remember famously uh carol lombard hitchcock had this um he famously he was told that he he says he he treats actors like cattle nice. yeah. yeah so on the set of mr and mrs smith which to be honest is not a very good movie it's not a very good hitchcock movie so yeah, uh, but actually it's quite similar to earlier movies he made made during his silent period and in his British period. Um, uh, Carol Lombard at one point uh, got all these animals, all these uh, sheep, etc., uh, in a pen, right? for Hitchcock to direct, brought them onto the set. Yeah. <laughs> so she uh, right? because because she had that sense of humor. 
And Hitchcock loved it. He 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 adored her, you know, for, for this. Because yeah. because because she got it, right? That he in this whole persona that Hitchcock made for the press that we read, right, is his sense of humor, is his sensibility that that is part of the entertainment that he gives us outside of the movies. Mm. Yeah. So, and they hide his real intent or his subtext. So people don't take him seriously as a filmmaker. They won't, you know, they won't say he's a serious filmmaker because he's just an entertainer. But actually, within those movies, he does have a subtext. He, he is talking about what is the nature of evil. Um, when you see something like um, Shadow of a Doubt, yeah. um, when you've got Joseph Cotton, who always has often played these great, sometimes grumpy, but always on the right side, characters and here in shadow of a doubt he's playing a serial killer what we would now call a serial mm -hmm. killer <clears throat> the merry widow killer and it is just an amazing examination of the fact that such a person exists in such a bucolic environment mm. All of these things are part of um, what Hitchcock is trying to say within his movies. How people react to him on the set is exactly, you know, is that sense of humour that he has, is those side characters. So in Shadow of a Doubt, he has a couple of characters in there who love true crime. The true crime aficionados, they follow all the latest murders. Yeah. They are the, if you like, the, the comedy aspect of this, uh, of the movie. And, and that's what Hitchcock does. He brings that sense of humor, that sensibility, in order to deflect from this serious thing mm -hmm. that, that it, in the movie. And he also does that in real life. Because he is the clown in, in in the interviews, and they deflect from this serious aspect of his own movies. Hmm. Well, okay. The hardest question no. of the day. No, no, no. I know what you're going to ask me. Well, yeah. What's your favorite Hitchcock film? I knew it. I knew <laughs> it. <laughs> well, you had to expect it. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, you, got, it, you have your it, desert island. You have your one DVD. Oh, <laughs> what's it gonna be? No, yeah. Well, first of all, you need a DVD player on the desert island. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe. Um, maybe not because you've got them all memorized. Uh, well, actually, that that is the thing, isn't it? You've got to do. It. Um, I, I, I mean, it, it it does vary. You know, from day to day, it will vary. Right. Uh, I think um, Shadow of a Doubt uh, mm -hmm. is in the top, in the top five. Vertigo in the top five. Rear Window top five. Uh, but but I really think that Shadow of a Doubt is is the one mm. today. Today, today <laughs> good enough. <laughs> is, is is today, and I I, I think it is this aspect. Of he brings in the idea of the duality. He's got a female lead character who's essentially we're seeing things from Charlie, played by mm -hmm. Theresa White, her point of view. Um, she's bookish, she's bright, she's intelligent, um, uh, she's on the cusp of growing up. So she's learning about the world. And she's learning how horrible the world can be. Yeah. So it's a loss of innocence film. You know, that the this 
and um, she's growing up where her father and her next door neighbor they love all this true crime stuff mm -hmm. but for them it's not real so and to her it's not real and they are the comedy aspect of the movie yeah but she's learning that it's no laughing matter and uh, you know so just thematically it is it is an incredible uh, movie about the um about the evil that lurks just below the surface of any person because we never know i mean jonathan i don't know you i i don't know you right mm -hmm. i don't know what dark secrets you have in real life and and, and, and no one's ever going to find out <laughs> so. exactly right <laughs> <laughs> but but we all have aspects of our character that will not look good on social media, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, uh, and and this is this is what real people are, are like. They're not bland. They're not on the surface. They always have this these currents going underneath. And what Theresa Wright is doing in this movie, and what Hitchcock is showing us is that there are currents underneath people that Theresa Wright looks perfect, beautiful. Underneath, she has a beating heart. Um, and, and we see that through the way that, that Hitchcock portrays that. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we feel her love for her uncle, and we feel that love being betrayed. We feel her being alone. Um, and we feel like having to face up to it and then having to do a, a horrible thing and live with that horrible thing for the rest of her life yeah. and keeping a secret for the rest of her life. Um, it is, um, you know, so that it doesn't hurt the rest of her family. You know, so, so the thing is that the film, the film has resonance it lives outside of the screen and it lives outside of the time that we are watching that movie. And uh, so this is what makes great movies. This is what makes great movies like Vertigo. Um, uh, and, and, and this is why they will, they will live on. This is why I'm fascinated by them. And this is why hundreds of thousands and millions of people are fascinated by them. Now, I have to ask, what are, you, what are you working on next? All right, well, I can't tell you. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so I've got a book, a big book coming out from Tashin, um, hopefully in the next couple of months, but it hasn't been announced yet, so oh, no. I, can't, <laughs> I can't talk about it. Uh, but I've finished it, essentially. I am working on, uh, I'm doing some uh, personal projects. So I'll just show you. Um, uh, there is a, an artist called uh, John M. Burns. I uh, don't know if you can see that. Yes. Uh, he's a comics artist. Uh, I've got... Uh, uh, they're all next door, but uh, he's in his 80s. He's just retired. He's been uh, making comics since the 1950s, drawing comics. He is probably the, I mean, he's the greatest. Uh, he's just a great, great comic uh, comic strip artist. And uh, I've been to visit him, and I'm going to do uh, various books on him, about him. I've interviewed him. Oh, fantastic. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm working on that. Uh, I'm, I should, I've still got copies of this uh, available <laughs> on my web store. And I, I think I, maybe, maybe I should update this and expand on it. Uh, I'm always, you know, uh -oh. doing little little projects like that. Who knows? Well, you, uh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. So how can people purchase the book in your web store? How can, how can people follow and purchase your book? Okay, well, I'm on um, social media at Kirsched, K-E-R-S-H-E-D. 
for on both um, Twitter now X, I suppose, right. and uh, and Facebook. Um, so th those are the main ones I, I use, and there are links to the web store there, or you can put it on the, underneath um, uh, when you uh, run this. Um, yeah, and I, I've, I've got a few, but basically stuff copies. I've, I've got a few copies left. I'll sign them as well if you want. That's you know, what I'll we deface, want to hear. I'll, I'll deface <laughs> them. And also because I do, um, be, because a lot of the books I do are very large and not easy to post, I, I also I do little book plates okay. um, that I sign and, and sell and, and, and send off. You know, for a few, for a few cents, and um, yeah, I'm welcome to do that. Yeah, fantastic. Send them well, around well, the world. You would not believe the places I've sent these things. To. As long as they can go to Florida, that's all I care about. But yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> of course, I've sent lots of them, lots of them to Florida. <laughs> well, Paul, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a treat to get to talk to you. Fascinating stuff. It's been so much fun. Uh, and we would, I know I speak for Ike, we would love to have you back to talk about Kubrick, which is okay. Ike's favorite. <laughs> so. okay. <laughs> but thank thank you again for joining us um well it's it's my pleasure I, I, i've really enjoyed it i'm uh, i'm very thirsty now so i need another <laughs> cup of tea i think <laughs> well I, this has been pop culture retro i'm jonathan rosen along with ike eisenman and again a very special thanks to paul duncan and please subscribe thank you for listening to pop culture retro where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast 